Hey guys, welcome back to my series of videos on digital filters. Now today, we're gonna to be looking at finite impulse response or FIR filters. What are they? What are their properties? And how do we actually build one? So we're gonna begin where we left off from the previous video with this picture of the impulse response of an ideal low pass filter. Remember, this is the time domain representation of the ideal low pass filter. So the main issue with this ideal filter, the reason why we can never implement it in real life is that it's non-causal. So for negative times, this filter is not zero. So how do we actually get around this? How do we solve this issue? Well, if you look back at the time domain representation of the ideal filter, you can actually just shift it to the right a little bit so that the main part of the filter, this main lobe over here is in the positive time and then just chop off the ends so that we get rid of all negative times. So this is just broken down into two simple steps, shifting and then truncation, which is essentially just multiplication by a window function. And we're gonna talk about this in a second. So let's represent our ideal impulse response that has been shifted by an H sub K. Again, this is the ideal impulse response of our ideal low pass filter after we've shifted it. Now our actual filter is gonna have an impulse response G sub K. And this is gonna be the product of H sub K and some window function W sub K. So the simplest window function we can think of is just a rectangular window. And this is equivalent to just chopping off the negative parts of our ideal impulse response and then chopping off the positive parts after a certain number of samples N. So mathematically, it's gonna look something like this. So W sub K is just one for zero up to the nth sample and zero everywhere else. And of course, when we multiply this by our ideal impulse response H sub K, we're gonna get G sub K, which looks something like this. Now, of course, this has all been in the time domain so far. That's why I've been using lowercase g, h, and w. Now in the frequency domain, this is just gonna be that uppercase G is the convolution of H and W. Now, something very important is that our window function W is gonna completely condition the way in which we transform our ideal filter H into the real one G. So starting from H, the shape of G completely depends on the window function W. Now, in order to examine how our window function W is gonna affect the shape of G, let's look at our window function in the frequency domain. So this is W in the frequency domain. It's again, basically a sync function, except it's a sync function in the frequency domain, not in the time domain. So we can divide this up into two sections. We have the main lobe over here, and then the various side lobes over here. Now, the size of the transition band of G is related to the width of the main lobe of W. The wider the main lobe, the longer the transition band, and the narrower the main lobe, the shorter the transition band. And remember, we want as small a transition band as possible in our ideal case. So how do you shrink this transition band of W? Well, you just take more samples. So the size of the transition band gets smaller and smaller as your number of samples n tends towards infinity. Then the ripples of G, are related to the area under the side lobes, and they basically stay constant even as you increase n. So increasing n doesn't actually have any benefit on the ripple of your real filter G. So again, to reiterate my point, the size of the transition band is related to the width of the main lobe, and that decreases as you take more samples, and the ripples are related to the area under the side lobes, which stays constant even as you take more and more samples. So what's the disadvantage of just taking thousands or millions of samples? Well, for one, you're gonna need a lot more computing power to process all those samples, but also a bigger shift means you're gonna have a bigger delay in your response because you need to wait for all those samples to be taken and process all those samples before you can actually spit out a response. Great, so now we know how to shrink our transition band. We just have to take more samples before we truncate. But if taking more samples has no effect on the pass band and stop band ripple, then how do we control those properties? Now this is where fancier window functions come in. So besides the rectangular window, which we just talked about, some examples of window functions include the triangular window, the Hanning window, and the Hamming window. So let's have a look at these window functions in the frequency domain so we can see how their shape affects the properties of our real filter G. So over here we have the standard rectangular window, which has a decently narrow main lobe, but it also has a lot of large side lobes, which are gonna confer quite a bit of ripple in the passband and the stop band. Then over here, we have our triangular window, which has a larger main lobe width than the rectangular window, but the side lobes confer a much larger attenuation. Then we have our Hanning window, which looks something like this. And finally, our Hamming window, which you can see has an even stronger side lobe attenuation than any of the other windows. 
So basically all you do is you choose the window function based on how much ripple you can afford. And then you take as many samples as you need to in order to shrink that transition band down to whatever your specification may be. Now I do wanna mention that I am making the approximation that we have the same amount of ripple in the pass band as well as the stop band. So delta P equals delta S equals some common delta. Now this isn't really the case, but it's close enough to being true. Now one very useful tool you can use is to have a look at a table that compares commonly used window functions. Now these typically have a column that tells you how wide your main lobe is as a function of your number of samples n. And you also have a column that tells you what your minimum stop band attenuation is. Now, if you don't know what I mean by minimum stop band attenuation and how that relates to stop band ripple, then do check out my previous video on ideal filters first. All right, so now I'm gonna give you guys a five-step recipe to design your own FIR filter. And after we go through this, then we're gonna look at a real example. So step one is to select a suitable window function W sub K based on how much ripple you can afford. So you decide how much ripple you can afford, convert that into a minimum stop band attenuation, and then use this table to select a window function that suits your needs. Step two is to specify an ideal frequency response of your filter H. Step three then is to compute the coefficients of your ideal filter H sub K. Then in step four, you're gonna to have to multiply these ideal filter coefficients h sub k with your window function w sub k to get your real filter g sub k. And of course, you're gonna to have to delay it to make it causal. Then finally, in step five, you evaluate the performance of this filter and then you reiterate steps one through four if necessary. Great, now let's try this out with an actual example. So let's say we want to build a filter with the following characteristics. Let's say that we want our lower and upper cutoff frequencies to be theta equals 0 0.1 and theta equals 0 0.15 respectively. Remember, this is in terms of the normalized frequency theta. Now, let's say that our maximum ripple is about delta equals 0 0.01, which equals a minimum stop band attenuation of about 40 decibels. So step one was to select a suitable window function from a table of commonly used windows. So we can immediately see that the first two window functions, the rectangular and the Bartlett or triangular window, don't meet the criteria of having a minimum stop and attenuation of minus 40 decibels because they have about minus 21 and minus 25 decibels. So we have to use a Hanning, Hamming or Blackman or some other window. So let's just pick a Hanning window. Our next job is to calculate what the value of n needs to be, the number of samples that we need to take. So if we look at our upper and lower cutoff frequencies, 0 0.1 and 0 0.15, we can see that the width of our transition band has to be 0 0.05. So using this formula here, we can see that 4 over n has to be the width of our transition band, 0 0.05, which then means that our number n has to be about 80 samples. So step two is to specify the ideal frequency response that we need h. So let's work out what our cutoff frequency is. Well, it should just be the average of the lower and upper cutoff frequencies. So the average of 0.1 and 0.15 is just 0.125. And the ideal frequency response that has a cutoff frequency of 0.125 is gonna look like a one all the way until theta equals 0.125 and then just a zero afterwards. So then step three is to compute the coefficients of this ideal filter H sub K, which is just gonna be the ideal filter in the time domain which in order to do that, we have to take the inverse Fourier transform of capital H. Now this is easier said than done, and in real life you'd actually have to do something like the discrete time Fourier transform, or perhaps the fast Fourier transform, but that's a topic of a whole other video. But anyways, once you compute these coefficients, you'll end up with something that looks like a discrete sync function. Now in step four, we put everything together in order to get our real filter coefficients g sub k. All right, so now that you have the real filter coefficients g sub k, in step five, all you need to do is evaluate its performance and then iterate steps one through four all over again if it's not good enough. So now that you know how to build up an FIR filter from the ground up mathematically, let's jump into the computer and see how we would do this on MATLAB. All right, so I've just opened up a blank MATLAB window and uh, the tool that we're gonna use to design FIR filters is called FIR1. So let's just look at the uh, help page for this. Now, let's see what this says, okay. Um, a filter design, FIR filter design using the window method, which is exactly what we described. So you use it like this, B equals FIR1, you pass in uh, the number of samples and the cutoff frequency, and it designs an nth order low pass filter and returns the filter coefficients in this n plus one length vector B. So this, um, this vector B is basically your filter coefficients, so G sub K is what we've been calling it. And uh, the cutoff frequency must be between zero and one. 
with one representing half the sample rate. So this has actually been uh, normalized to a slightly different scale to what we use. We've been uh, representing this from 0 to 0 0.5 with 0 0.5 representing half the sample rate. Um, the reason why they've normalized it to this scale is basically when you multiply this by pi and then you multiply this by radians per second, well, your, your sample rate in radians per second, then you get things all in radians per second. But we've been talking in terms of uh, hertz, so we use a scale from 0 to 0 0.5. But it really doesn't matter what scale you use, you just have to note that the values that uh, we came up with in the example with uh, 0 0.125 as the normalized cutoff frequency, we have to double it because you know this is double the scale, so we're actually going to pass in 0 0.25 in this case. Let me know in the comments if this is confusing still, because I do feel like this can be quite a point of confusion, but I don't want to dwell on it for too long. Basically, all you have to know is you have to double the values that we came up with in our scale, because the scale that this uses is 0 to 1. All right, so anyways, I'm going to ignore this for now. Okay, you can also use it to design a high pass filter by passing this into the command. And if you specify two cutoff frequencies, you can then design a band pass or a band stop filter too. And you can do fancier things. Okay. And then of course you can specify the window function because you might not want to use the default Hamming window. And how you use that is uh, in the commands after your cutoff frequency, you pass in this window function. Now this window function is going to take in one argument, which is the number of coefficients, window coefficients we want to generate. And uh, this is expecting n plus 1, so this is n, we want n plus 1 window coefficients. And um, the window functions that you can use, if we just look at the helpful window, are all of these ones here. You can see we have a Bartlett window, we have a triangular, a rectangular, the Hamming, and the Hanning window, which is actually the one that we're going to use for, for the example. So let's actually jump in and use this tool, we'll just uh, clear this. Um, so let's say g is equal to fir1, so we wanted 80 samples. Now our cutoff frequency was 0 0.125 in our scale, so in this uh, scale from 0 to 1, we're going to have to put 0 0.25, double that. And uh, the window function was the Hanning window, and uh, remember it wanted an n plus 1 window coefficient, so we have 80 here, 181 here. And you can see it's returned, uh, these are the filter coefficients for g sub k. This is our filter g sub k. And uh, if we were to plot this on the time axis, this would be a truncated and shifted sync function. And if you want to actually visualize what this uh, filter looks like, you can then use this command fv tool, you pass in the filter in as an input, and it will bring up this nice graphical user interface, uh, which basically gives you the frequency response of the filter. And of course, this is the magnitude plot. You can also look at the phase plot, but I'm going to ignore that for now. So this is the frequency response of our filter. And you can see the cutoff frequency is, you know, right about here, 0 0.25, exactly where we want it to be. And if you remember, so this is our transition band, it probably starts around here to somewhere around here. And if you remember, we designed it so our transition band goes from 0 0.1 in our normalized frequency scale to 0 0.15, which in this scale corresponds to 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, which, you know, is exactly here, 0 0.2 to exactly 0 0.3. And uh, we specified that the minimum stop band attenuation should be at least 40 decibels. So let's see if we pass that. Uh, you can see that everything is in the stop band is lower than this point here. And this line is the minus 40 dB line. So we do in fact meet that criteria. And you can see there's actually very little pass band ripple. In fact, if I were to zoom in, you could probably see it just, yeah, there's a tiny bit of pass band ripple, but really not very much. Now, um, you can look at this in the time domain by clicking this button over here. This is the impulse response of the filter in the time domain. And here you go. This is exactly what we expect it to be. It is a sync function that has been shifted by n over 2 samples, so 40 samples, and truncated at uh, both ends here. So this, this is our entire filter. There are no more samples beyond what you can see over here. Now, let's try this out with a different window function. Let's use a rectangular window function and see how you know that wouldn't work for our case. Let's close this, let's clear this, and let's say g2 is equal to fir1. So again, let's use 80 samples. Um, this was uh, 0 0.25 and a rectangular window, length 81. Oop. We have to use fir1, I forgot. Okay. Now, if we were to visualize this, we would get this. Okay, so you can see that there is very much more ripple in the rectangular window, especially in the uh, passband, you can notice it. 
and uh, the minimum stop band attenuation is you know just above uh, minus 20 dB. I would say this may be minus 21 or 22 decibels, which is definitely not enough. You know, we specified that we wanted it to be under minus 40. However, this does roll off a lot faster, so the transition band is much smaller. I would say you know it's kind of from about 0 0.2. 0.22 to maybe 0.27 or so, uh, which is definitely a faster roll off. But again, we have more ripple, both in the pass band, which you can obviously see here, and in the stop band. So that's all for this video. Hopefully you now have a good idea of what an FIR filter is and how you would build one, both on paper and on MATLAB. And in the next video, we'll start looking at infinite impulse response filters and how they compare to our FIR filters discussed today.